You can't enjoy your favorite Disney Channel. No Animal Planet for you, that's for damn sure. Nothing. No TikTok. No World Star. That's it. Game over, son. Black Hawk down. You're screwed. Hello everybody. For those of you who do not know me, which statistically most of the people watching this video do not know me, uh, my name is Zach Moss. I study Western security policy, specifically U.S. security policy. I'm living in France. Currently I'm an Airbnb, so I don't have any of my like media tech because I'm always on the road and all that other fun stuff. I studied security policy in the Middle East, specifically uh, in the Israel, Palestine area, Syria, Lebanon, every other fun little area over there. And uh, I want to talk about just a real quick video, kind of informal, fun facts about the Taliban, specifically what's going on right now, because everybody knows all the craziness. But there are some crazy things going on that not a lot of you guys know, because it's not covered so much in the media. That's what I want to talk about. So this is a good video if you're like walking around trying to get a croissant or something. I don't know, whatever you guys end up doing. Uh, Timestamps are also in the comment section if this is YouTube and Rockfin, if this is kind of on my local shows in Oregon, in the USA, then that's pretty dope as well, but I don't have any description box kind of uh, like timestamps or any of that other fun stuff. Anyway, first thing I want to talk about is the Taliban and what exactly does what their version of equality even mean? How does that even look? What can we anticipate moving forward? Okay. So first things first, for those of you who don't know, the Taliban said that they're focusing a lot on universal equality between what they consider to be males and females. Obviously, the Taliban doesn't recognize anything in between. So what exactly does that mean and what can we pull from this? Well, fun fact, in the 1990s, the Taliban actually took over. A lot of people don't actually know that. So it was about roughly 1996 to 2001, the Taliban controlled all of Afghanistan. So we've already seen this picture before. So everybody flipping out and losing their, their marbles or their peas or whatever the saying goes, we've seen these things already. It's a little bit different now though because they're trying to learn from their lessons in the past and try to pull that and take with it with them for the future. So for example, in the past, girls who were younger than 10 were able to receive an education, 10 and older they were not. So for example, there was an individual, her name was Malala. She was internationally recognized as the spokesperson for universal women's education as a result of the fact that her dad owned a school in Afghanistan. She was really big in education. She got shot in the face by the Taliban, thus creating the image that we see today. She survived miraculously, and that's the story. Well, the Taliban is trying to allegedly learn from those mistakes by allowing women to have education up to the university level. So the question is, should we believe them or do we think that they're full of shit and they're just crazy crackpots who are, how do we put this, taking very extremist views in order to impose their vision of society. Well, I don't think that women are going to be allowed university level education. First things first, I think that right now in Afghanistan, everybody lacks opportunity. It's one of the most impoverished countries in the world. I believe last I checked, it's the bottom five most impoverished countries in the world. With that said, university level education is something that's hard to come by by most, most people in Afghanistan, let alone women. So do I think that there's going to be informal ways to stop women from receiving that education? Yes. Right now they're trying to garner international support, excuse me, but I don't think they're actually going to support this. A lot of times they say these things, but then they'll have local factions fight against women to ensure that they don't have these actual opportunities. That way they can save face while also stopping women in the process. So that's something that we can expect. Next, in terms of equality, one thing that we should focus on is entertainment that the society is able to enjoy. Back in the 1990s, 1990s the Taliban had imposed certain regulations to stop people from watching TV, listening to music, and watching movies. Imagine for a second, your life, Afghanistan, you can't watch a movie. You can't enjoy your favorite Disney channel. No Animal Planet for you, that's for damn sure. Nothing. No TikTok. No World Star. That's it. Game over, son. Black Hawk down. You're screwed. What's interesting is I don't necessarily know. <laughs> I'm sorry. There is someone's watching me behind the camera right now. Went a little off script there for a second. I'm probably blushing. <laughs> Anyway, 
Oh, God damn it, where was I? Oh, yes, media. I think they're gonna embrace some aspects of media, but I think persecution is st still going to go high, be high, however you wanna say. You bear with me, okay? I'm dealing with some flight hour differences between the states and Paris. So what do I mean specifically is I think right now the Taliban is utilizing social media as opposed to prohibiting it in order to push their public image because they realize that they have to deal with the international community. And also, I believe over 60% of people in Afghanistan in big cities have phones. I believe it might even be up to 70% in major cities have phones. So how are you going to like obviously cut them out of the equation because you could blow up the satellites and all that other fun stuff. It doesn't stop the fact that they're internationally aware of what's going on in people's views of Afghanistan. So you might as well work with that as opposed to fight against it. And that's what they're trying to do. So I think they're going to allow certain sects of the entertainment industry in. We also, by the way, fun fact, I'm going to go off script again here for a second. You also saw the same thing in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia decided to crack down like a medieval knight against what they believe to be sorcerers and crack the holy bejesus down on all entertainment sectors until somebody named Mohammed bin Salman al Saud, otherwise known as the Saudi Crown Royal Prince, decided to open up the entertainment sector. And one of the very first Westerners that he allowed in the country was none only than the fake booty herself, Nicki Minaj. Yeah, talk about going from zero to a thousand real quick. But anyway, that's kind of a fun fact. Oh, by the way, he did that because he was persecuting other people and wanted to cover it up. So he's like, here's some entertainment, let me do this other thing. But I digress. So I think what we're going to learn so far is the Taliban, they might be a little bit better in certain areas, but I think they're more than likely going to be similar to what they used to be. By the way, what they used to be was in everything from beheadings to amputations for things like adultery and uh, floggings unconsensually, by the way, and uh, all the other things in between there, right? Okay, we got the point. We know what they're like. They're half a step better than ISIS, sometimes as bad as ISIS, depending on how they're feeling that day. Next, what are their views on drugs? Now you might be thinking, Zach, this is a very silly conversation. We have better things to talk about. Well, not exactly. So just, you follow me on this through this chaotic rabbit hole that I'm putting all of us through. I hope it's for the better, but we'll see. So drugs is a huge part of Afghani culture, specifically for their economy. So if, if the Taliban is following the Sharia law in accordance of what they believe the Sharia law to be, then they should be cracking down on this, you know, harder than the the the... What's a good example of this? Cracking down harder than the Home Alone kid allowed the burglars to get into his house, you know? But it's a huge part of the economy, so what's gonna happen? Well, I do have somewhat of an answer here for you. So the Taliban had allegedly banned the sale and the use of opium. However, they're claiming now that they need international support for this, which by the way, this is just a money grab. They're gonna try to get international support to get more aid pumping through there because things like the US decided to tell them to F off and that we're not gonna give them aid. Which, by the way, that's actually going to hurt mostly the Afghani people, but it's like, do you help the Taliban and help the Afghani people, or do you scrap them all? I don't know. But that's what we're dealing with. Back in the 1990s, we had the same issue, the same situation. However, the Taliban did cut down opium production by 91%, which is, by the way, that, I mean, that's pretty notable, right? However, you know, when you're dealing with things like extremism and poverty and all these other things, I don't necessarily know of opium as the, the last thing you really want to crack down on. Which, by the way, side note too, if you crack down on opium, when you're talking about an international perspective, you're going to talk about the increase in synthetic opium, by the way, like, like fentanyl. So when we're dealing with that, it's like, are we going to have less heroin potentially internationally? Well, sure, but you're also going to have more fentanyl in things like Western Europe and in the Americas as well. So just a fun fact, something to keep in mind, you know, the whole life in the world is interconnected. So you got you to gotta watch out how the strings are being pulled kind of deal. Also, fun fact, so in Afghanistan, opium production accounts for 1.5 to $3 billion. That's a lot of billies, and not even the ones in the hills either. And that is according to the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, if that means anything to you guys, if you're going to be one of those uh, internet people trying to crack down on my sources here. And by the way, what they really are, they're the ones who are trying to monitor the situation in Afghanistan, and uh, they've been painfully off on a lot of things, but I do believe this figure is actually going to be correct because usually with figures related to drugs, they're usually pretty correct. It's mostly about Taliban fighters that they just lose it all because they realize that they're lying about everything, literally, according to the Afghanistan papers, which I'll get into. Next, Iran. 
Iran's an interesting one too. What a lot of people don't know, by the way, is before COVID and all that other fun stuff, Iran actually accepted a lot of Afghani workers because obviously there's a lot of impoverished people in Afghanistan. Iran wanted some sort of stability in Afghanistan because they're all connected. So Iran actually allowed 1.5 to 3 million Afghani workers in there. They're mostly wage laborers, so like, you know, your construction and all that other fun stuff. But that's interesting. So like, how is Iran going to deal with the Taliban? Because obviously everybody's trying to run away from Afghanistan for the most part. I mean, that's literally why you see people jumping on helicopters and jumping off buildings in order to escape. Well, before Afghanistan, there was a president named Ghani who was U.S. backed. Ghani, which by the way, he fled the country with $100 million, $106 million in cash. He was not able to publicly recognize relations with Iran too much because he was backed by the U.S. It looks like right now that Iran and Taliban, even though Iran is Shia, Taliban is Sunni, it looks like they have more or less positive relations, which is kind of, it, I don't know, I mean, it's kind of an interesting fun fact. That's kind of a change in the international system. For example, the Taliban right now had discounted tariffs by 70% to Iran. So what that means in normal people terms is when Iran sends things into Afghanistan and tries to sell them, normally there's tariffs to stop Iran goods to some extent and make Afghani products in Afghanistan more popular. But the Taliban, just to be homey, decided to cut down tariffs or larger taxes by 70% on Iranian production. Also, it looks like relations in terms of oil between Afghanistan and Iran are also going to increase. So that's pretty fascinating as well. The last one I want to talk about as well is China. This might surprise you, but China has a border with Afghanistan. Yeah, fun fact. I don't, I don't think else. <laughs> I don't think anybody knows this, but they do. It's a tiny one. I mean, I wish I had my editing system right now because I'll show you a little picture, but it's a little one, but they still have a border. Why that is significant is because China actually has soldiers in Afghanistan right now, trying to stabilize that border. China is also building a railway from China to Afghanistan in order to send goods and services and things like minerals and oils because Afghanistan has over a trillion dollars mineral wealth while the U.S. is very salty that they can't get their hands on that, kind of like they get their hands on oil everywhere else. But in this case, we're also talking about minerals. By the way, something that just occurred in my brain is also the fact that a lot of the renewable energy that we have, like renewable batteries, that's made from minerals from Afghanistan. So I'm not really sure how that's going to affect, say, like the Tesla, by example. So China right now has decent relations. I think the difference right now between China and the U.S. with respect to Afghanistan is the fact that China is trying to go through economic rebuilding. They're not trying to state build. They're just trying to say, look, we're trying to get a cut of the cash. So are you? Let's try to work together. Now, do I think that really benefits a lot of Afghanis? Who knows? Who knows? A lot of the countries that are built on corruption, such as the old Afghani government, most of the people don't receive that type of wealth. It's mostly pocketed at the very top. But anyway, I thought those things were pretty interesting. I think there's a lot of misconceptions and things about the Taliban that a lot of people don't know. Hopefully that gives you a fun little tidbit that you can awkwardly bring up to your grandma during uh, whatever the next holiday is, you know, in case you guys are trying to talk about these things. Maybe mention how Iran and China and other people outside of the U.S. are affected by U.S. policy. I don't know, or not. But anyway, hopefully you guys got something out of this. Thank you very much. Hopefully next time I'll have my editing equipment and I can start busting out some fun facts to physically show you. Anyway, thank you very much.